you do um, receive a portion of interest income as well. This is about expenses. Oh, the expenses. Yeah. Yep. So, um, David, any thoughts on what's running through other expenses? So, um, actually, most of that's the. Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Cunningham, come on up to the podium. Um, actually, most of that is going to be transfers. So, trans so the general fund um, receives um, additional cash and inflows, and then those majority of that is being transferred out to the plant funds um, to help with deferred maintenance on buildings, plant equipment. So it's feeding to the other. Correct. Um, categories. Yes. But it's, it's being reported under other. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And, and it's state. The expense reporting is based on the functional, uh, traditional functional basis, instructional, in, in, instructional support, and so on. These are things that fall to the normal sort of functional areas, such as, um, as you would say, transfers and so on. Okay. Is there any other questions? So, our uh, student navigators and counselors are they in student services? Is that student services is personnel? Yeah. Well, student services represent things that are um, non-instructional, so we represent oh. uh -huh. Daniel Hurst's areas. Right, so that's like counseling, uh, advising, uh -huh. where navigators okay. would be. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, then, is everybody good? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I should say I, I demoted uh, David. He's Dr. Cunningham, not Mr. Cunningham. <laughs> Next. Enrollment. Board Report 4529, Vice President Herbst. <coughs> President Cavaluna, um, Chair Petlikoff, Board Members, uh, distinguished guests, visitors, um, faculty and staff. <coughs> um, thank you for this opportunity for me to be able to talk about a very important issue, which is enrollment. Um, I think the last time I had an opportunity to speak to this group was in this room, and it was in a snowy January day. We had a retreat, and we started to talk about these issues. And the mouse isn't working. Hold on just a second. Um, so I'm going to be able to talk to you tonight about uh, the good news about the enrollment report. Um, but I'm here only as a representative. Oops, hello. Go back. Never set your your folder on your laptop. Uh, on the laptop, never works well that well. Uh, we are going to talk about the enrollment report, the uh, increase in enrollment that we've had, and the reason we're doing it. But I'm not here because it's because of me. Um, I'm just really part of a really brilliant team of people who have taken a very difficult situation and has dressed it in a way that most colleges are not doing it. Um, I've provided some PowerPoint pictures, but this will not be death by PowerPoint. I don't have a lot of numbers. It'll be mostly dialogue between myself and any board members who have questions. Um, before I begin my presentation, <clears throat> I would like to say that I should not be standing up here alone. Um, there's another gentleman who is not here tonight, and that's Dr. Michael Nealon. He did a lot of work toward this as well, and I miss him. I know that he'll be back soon, and I just want to remember him to, to the board tonight that he had a lot to do with this as well. Um, as President Cavaluna so rightly said in an email recently to the campus community that um, the enrollment increase, that each data point is really a human being. And we're not talking just about numbers. We are talking about the lives of the people that we're touching and we're changing and that we're helping. So all of that's so important for us to remember as we talk about enrollment increases tonight. Recently, a recruiter at an uh, evening event uh, met a young woman who was deaf and there was no sign language interpreter available to be able to help him, to be able to communicate with her. So instead of sending her away, he sat with her for two hours and typed notes back and forth on his laptop until he was able to convince the young woman to come to HFC. That's what it takes to increase enrollment in today's society, serving our community at a much higher level. I'm very pleased that he did that. But I would have been just as pleased if the young woman had decided to go to another university or a college just because we're in the business of higher education. He turned her on to higher education and let her know that she could go. And so because of that, she's going to come here first and then go on to a four-year school. 
So I'm very pleased with the work that he was able to do for that. Back in January when we first met in this room, we talked about fall enrollment predictions. As you remember, we talked about it going to be down 3%. They've been down 3% for most of the last few years, and that's what everyone projected. So I came across an image which I thought how most people probably felt when they left that day when we uh, went on to, uh, <laughs> to talk about how things are going to happen. The other thing that we talked about were enrollment issues. What kind of problems did we have here on campus and what did we need to address? And most of the people were concerned about the enrollment processes that we had at our college. So this is probably the, the idea that most people had about the way that we were trying to enroll students. And I can tell you, this is not Henry Ford. It never has been and it never will be. But that was an attitude I think a lot of people, not just the board, but other people had about enrollment services. And the turnaround and the change that we had, and we'll talk about it just in a few minutes, has to do with not only processes, but the way that our attitudes and, and, and the morale has changed on this campus when it comes to enrollment. So now for the good news. As you've all received in your email and memo, we are actually up 1.48% 1 1 over the same time last year. And that would be a comparison to uh, the last day of drop ad. We compare it to that year to year. And so that's where we were a year before. Um, that's a major turnaround from the 3% down that we were predicting, as well as the additional, the additional credit hours that we added. So if you look at the credit hours from last year, and in comparison to the credit hours for this year, you'll see that we're up. The general college is the on-campus. You'll see the dual enrollment is also up, and it gives us a total of 1.46. There's an asterisk by the fall because there's a, there's a three credit class that shows up in my data that I'm not sure where it comes from, but if you add the numbers down, you have to have that three included, otherwise it doesn't look like you know how to add. <laughs> so that's why I added the asterisk at the end of that. Headcount. Headcount is also very important. A lot of colleges and universities talk about their headcount. And it's important to Henry Ford as well. But even though headcount and uh, credit hours are interchangeable, I mean, they're, they're, they're dependent upon each other, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Sometimes headcount will go up and your, 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 your uh, enrollment, uh, your, your headcount will go up, but your credit hours won't go up as equivalent. We're actually down a little bit in headcount, but we're up in, in uh, uh, credit hours. So as you see that we're actually on campus, we're actually up 60 students. Dual enrollment is down 89 students, which means we're 29 students down. I actually have current, more, current, current num more current numbers than this that were, came out today, and we're actually 10 students down total. Dr. Herbst, can you um, define unduplicated? Oh, sure. <coughs> unduplicated headcount means that every student gets counted one time, no matter how many courses they're taking. So an unduplicated headcount would just be the total number of individuals who come to campus. Um, I, I added that on here, and I know you've asked me about that before privately. And it, it is, is a number, it's a term, is a term that we use in enrollment services all the time. Um, but it's also very important for us to understand that the 10,701 uh, students we have on campus are 10,701 different individuals. Same as dual enrollment, same as the uh, the total at the bottom. Questions about either credit hours or, or head count right now? Trustee, yes, sir. Is it, what's the main reason that dual enrollment is down? Is there du a main reason for it? Uh, dual enrollment at that as size of number, it, as far as head count down, yeah. um, there are fewer students uh, applying to be in, in, in dual enrollment right now. Um, we're working with uh, um, Magid, we're working with Dr. Falala about this situation. I know that Holly Diamond has been working very closely with the various high schools. Um, even though the, the head count is down, the, the credit hours is up. So they're actually taking more maybe they're not, more classes, or maybe they're taking a four hour class instead of a three hour class, which will give them a higher head count as time. That's Lane. The, of the 1,971, how many of those are Dearborn public schools, and how many are other? Have, uh, Holly, do, do you have an answer we, for that one? Um, we do have that breakdown. I don't have it with me, but a majority of them are Dearborn public schools. Uh, a large majority, or a large majority, uh, absolutely, like eighty percent, something like that. I would. Uh, I can get that number for you, but it is a really large mm -hmm. majority. 
follow up on that. We, we are doing some more work with dual enrollment outside of the district right now, but that number is, 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 is slowly growing. And it looks like some places will be able to grow some headcount that way. Yeah. But right now, most of our students do come through the Dearborn public I mean, schools. the Dearborn Heights in, in Detroit are natural ones. Right. Uh, but uh, cred credit hours average per student? Is do right around nine hours. So it's three quarters of a, three quarters of a full-time student. And is that typical for a typical for community college, college yes. Mm -hmm. Although, um, it, as I mentioned in the board report, yeah. there is some there is some push for that number to go up. Um, there is a large push in Tennessee where they found that students who take a small number of hours to begin with do not persist to graduation as well as students who will be able to take more uh, credit hours. Now, I know that a lot of our students work. And that comes to a decision point. Do they work because they have to? Then those students probably will be better off taking smaller classes. But if, take, if, if these students are working because they want to, and but they don't need to for family support, those students may be, be able to take a few more credit hours and graduate quicker. I, I've always believed that, that each in individual student should be looked at individually, either by a counselor or by an advisor to decide which class that there would be, the number of classes they would be able to take. I appreciate you adding that statistic to the report too because it surprised me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think what we want to keep in mind is we want student success at the end of the day. Absolutely. And so if they're taking less classes but being successful in completing them and passing those classes because they understand their abilities and needs, it, it, you know, I don't want to push somebody to where the, it, it becomes overwhelming for them. As this young man had stated that others were finding at a four-year mm -hmm. college. So that I, I think we, we want to be careful in how we identify what students can, can um, take on an extra class and, and what students know what their ability level is and, and how much that they can pursue at a, any given time. Well, I actually had a, there was, there was a, a, another story that I had about a staff member who's not a counselor, not an advisor, but somebody who works in the enrollment services area. And she works with students who are, are struggling and, and are, um, I mean, every student that she's met this summer, she keeps in contact with an email. And one student came to her because of that, and he had, his GPA had dropped really badly. He was a full-time student and dropped really badly. He wanted to take more classes to make up for the classes that he had done poorly in and to get back on track. And she worked with a counselor to make sure that this student took only six hours this semester, which she's now keeping track with him, and he's actually doing great in those six hours. He'll be able to take the 15 or 12 to 15 hours in the winter semester to be able to get back on track again. But we're very conscious of the fact that the student has to be successful to their needs right. and not to our needs. So I appreciate yeah. that very much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. The big question that everybody asked me, and um, my answer is, how come we had the large enrollment increase? And if you're, doc if you're President Cavalluna, you've heard me say this before, do you have four hours? Because I can talk a, a long time about this, but he's given me 15 minutes. And so I'm, I'm gonna really shorten the, the, the discussion on how we're gonna be able to explain to you how we're we'll be able to do this. And the biggest change I believe on this campus that's occurring is a cultural change. The uh, enrollment services area, we have training on Friday Every Friday, this is, we're going into our second full year of doing trainings on Friday to be able to address everything from uh, departments understanding each other, faculty <coughs> coming and do presentations. This Friday, uh, the advisors and the counselors are presenting to the entire team. Everybody talks about their area so they can understand what's going on in other areas. We're tearing down the internal silos and we're making sure that people understand that we're here to serve students first. I've mentioned this in, in January, and I'll mention it again. The big phrase that we use all the time is what serves students best and what are we willing to do about it? And right now I see a major change in the way that enrollment services is doing that. So is that what you would, that's what you attribute to the, the trend, <coughs> the upward trend is the touch, the individual touch to students. Right. And rather than, uh, I, I'm hoping that's not a leading indicator for a recession because. Uh, well. Again, that's, that's the other thing that causes what, there, community college enrollment to rise. I've explained enrollment as a balloon and, and it declines its death by a thousand pinpricks. It's not just one thing. This increased culture, this better uh, hands, one to one relationship of the, the recruiter I talked about, <coughs> the enrollment uh, specialist I talked about, that type of 
behavior has always existed here, but I think we're getting much better at it across the board. I will be talking about specific programs in just a minute that do address some of the reasons why I think enrollment went up as well. I have to tell you that I, 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 was, I was completely wrong in, in January when I was here, because I told you it would take us two years to turn it around. But due to the work of SEM through uh, Holly Diamond and Dr. Jennifer Ernst and the other people on this campus, they were able to do it in one year. And I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the work they're doing. I, I think we're headed in the right direction. But I would tell you that we can't stop now. I said we worked really hard to be able to get enrollment up 1.48%. And the hardest work is still in front of us. And so we have to realize that, that, that this is not, we can't stop and rest on our laurels. We can't keep doing, we, we have to keep improving. Um, some of the events that we did have, and one of them was very counterintuitive, and I did have a long discussion with Pre President Cavaluna uh, before we did this, which was the early deregistration. We moved it up several weeks. We dropped, we went from being 3% down to being 11% down in one day. <laughs> I, I, I heard some uh, gasp from some people when that happened. And, um, but we knew it was the right thing to do. It was a reset of making sure that the students who are registering for the classes were prepared to be able to be in those classes. That means you have to be prepared academically, you have to be prepared socially, and you have to be prepared financially. If they're not prepared in one of these three areas, they're not going to be successful. So removing them early gave them a chance to reset, get their act together, get their finances in place, but also allowed students who were waiting for those classes to be able to fill those in, and those students who came in were able to pay, and they had the social support, and they had the academic support. So it was the right thing to be able to do. I can remember uh, talking with President Cavalino before our second enrollment uh, deregistration. He said, do you want to do that? You fought really hard. We've been 11% down. We're up to 3% down. Do you want to do another dereg tomorrow? I said, yeah. I, I said, I've looked at the numbers. I think we're going to be up after a dereg. He goes, how is that even possible? And we were up barely over one uh, barely over flat line, but we were up this after the second dereg because the numbers were then in place where the students were being enrolled properly. So consequently, we should hope that Dr. Uh, Gatko will find improved student success uh, in graduation rates if all of the factors come together. Yeah, so that, that, is, that is all part of it too. The students who register early who are prepared do, I mean, Valencia Community College and, and Dr. Sugar down there has proven that the students who register early and who are ready and prepared they, 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 they do better in classes, they graduate, they go on and do better at four-year school. So that's exactly what we're trying to emulate as well. Um, I also want to say a few other things that have worked out for us really well. We had a great Super Saturday event on, on, on this last fall where we, had, we were open from 9 to 1. We had families and, and students coming into the Welcome Center, and the place was just packed from 9 o'clock until 1 o'clock that afternoon serving students. And that was due to uh, Holly Diamond and her staff out there be able to help students. Uh, we have now improved faculty engagement in reaching out to students, so that's really coming through Dr. Ernst and her side of, of the house to be able to help students and be able to do that. Um, everyone I've talked to gives great credit to Rhonda DeLong and her marketing because so we're out on social media better than we've ever been before. So all the ways that students communicate with each other, we're communicating with them even better than we have in the past. So that's, when I said it's just not one thing, it's a thousand things that we're trying to address, those are the things that we're, we're addressing and we're addressing quickly, but we have other things that we still have to do. We also talk about retention. Once we have students, how do we keep them? Because every year, if you, if you spend all your energy recruiting students and we do nothing for them afterwards, we're not serving students at all. And so it, uh, I mentioned earlier that our, our, re <laughs> our enrollment right now is actually higher than it was. Um, we're up a 1.51 now percent instead of 1.46%. Um, our retention efforts are starting to pay off. We're doing better outreach. We're doing outward call out more outbound calls to students. If students miss a counseling meeting, or if they miss an advising meeting, or if they miss another meeting anywhere in the enrollment services, that used to just sort of like be a secondary thought to call them. They're now being called and rescheduled immediately so that they come back in so they don't fall off and we don't lose track of them. We are in, um, doing a, uh, in SOLA, in the School of Liberal Arts, we're now using uh, a retention, a early alert program that we hadn't used before. We're gonna roll that out to the entire campus come the winter semester. That's where if a faculty member sees a student who's being absent, they send off uh, an email to uh, an office in the enrollment services 
they reach out and make contact and find out what kind of service they need, whether it be counseling, whether it meets financial aid services. Maybe, maybe they need academic advising. Maybe they were in the wrong classes and they need to start thinking about rescheduling for the next semester. Those types of efforts we've done in the past, but they're much more intentional now. And we're doing uh, a lot better, having a lot better success of being able to do that. One of the things that uh, Dr. Ants is really proud of the fact is we're doing more late start classes. So students who come in late who want to register, instead of shoving them into classes that have already started, we have a late start schedule that fits a lot more of their needs. So we have more students who are able to register for classes at 14 weeks and be able to make sure that they're successful to the end of the semester. These are all, I, as I said, I could talk about this for hours, about all the different activities that we're doing on our campus. Um, we're also working on a year-round academic schedule. It's something that uh, Dr. Nealon and I have talked about since day one when I came on campus two years ago that we would really like to be able to do that. That would mean that a student would be able to come in in July, see their whole schedule through uh, the fall semester and the winter semester. So if they have to work experiences and those other types of things, child care that they have to worry about, they could set that all up ahead of time and figure out where they'd be able to take their classes and when. We're not there yet, but those are the type of things that we're looking toward the future to be able to help our students be uh, successful here at Henry Ford College. Um, I did want to talk about SEM just, just for a minute. I, I talked about SEM at length in the January meeting. We talk about SEM all the time. But every time I go to either a local conference or talk to someone across the country who calls me to talk about our enrollment issues, I tell them how we're doing our strategic enrollment management. Their question is, how do we get it done? And the reason is that we have a different model than other people have around the country. We have a core team of four faculty and five administrators. Each one of those members meet um, to meet, to meet weekly or uh, every other week now? Monthly. monthly for the core team, you're meeting monthly now? And they meet monthly and instead of having 55 people in a room trying to discuss a problem, you have nine highly focused, highly uh, vi viable people in this room to try to solve the problems. Currently we have nine sub-teams working out. We've reached out to include 28 faculty and staff and community members in these sub-teams to answer specific questions such as uh, scholarships or adult population. We have a Lat Lat Latinx group that are working with Southwest Michigan trying to get uh, an open door policy going <coughs> for more of the students from that part of the state, that part of the area. All this is really all the things that we're working on this particular time as we're moving forward. Um, as I said, SEM is co-chaired by Dr. Jennifer Ernst and, and Holly Diamond, and they are really one of the major reasons why we're being successful this year and being able to get enrollment up. It's most of the time when you put together a SEM team, a strategic enrollment management team, most schools will take a year to evaluate what's going on. They, they got started last October. By January, they were on the ground running. And by this August, they had made a change in our culture and the way that students are being treated here at Henry Ford. So that's a lot different than the way it's done in a lot of schools around the country. Um, the, uh, the, I have this, the, the sub-teams here, and they were listed in the board report I did. But the revision of the seven steps to enrollment, which is on the enrollment side. Focus on 45, which is actually a, a uh, Students who have 45 credits, getting them on to graduation. Uh, President Cavalluni was, was, was speaking to the young man who was here just a, uh, a few minutes ago about, are you going to graduate? That has become part of our speech to students. Not do you want to come here and then transfer on. Do you want to come here? Do you want to get a great education? Do you want to graduate? And then do you want to transfer on? Because we, we know from <coughs> national studies that students who graduate with a degree transfer out and do better at a four-year school than students who are one class short of graduation. It's like in the 20% range better than students who just miss that one class. We know how important having that degree from Henry Ford is before they graduate. So that's become part of our vernacular, I mean, part of our speech pattern when we talk to students. Come here, get a great education, graduate, and move on. Um, there's a scholarship going on, and the last thing I want to mention is the optimal enrollment team that's being worked on right now. Uh, when we presented in January, we gave you a, a, a term of 14,500. That was really Dr. Nealon and I just trying to work those numbers out what we felt would be the optimal enrollment point. But Dr. Lori Gonko and her team are currently working on a whole list of things on how to be able to get an optimal enrollment point. That's the highest number of students we can serve using the, the current status that we have for classrooms and for faculty and for staff availability and those other types of things. 
that number is so important to us because that's how we're going to be able to determine how quickly we can grow, sustain that growth, and then build on that growth as we go move forward. The last thing I want to say, and I'll open it up for questions, is that I really wanted to stand up here and read the names of about 100 people who have worked really hard this last year to get our enrollment turned in the right direction. Every one of them is either a frontline staff, middle management, faculty member, upper management, and administrator. Um, the last story I have comes um, last week, two faculty members who had been here for a long time sat down with the head of advising and said, we want to understand the advising experience. So the head of advising went through this whole experience with them, took her about an hour, and she took her time, because her faculty, she took her time because they wanted to make sure she understood everything that the, every student experiences when they come through. When she got done, she said, I love the fact that you're here, but why did you come? They said that, he called him president, I'm quoting, President Russ said at the state of the college that we are all responsible for recruitment and retention, and we figured we'd better learn what it was all about. And so they came over, and it was a great experience for them. They sent glowing emails to her and to myself about the experience they had, and now they're going to go out on the road, take that on the road, and show other faculty the enrollment processes so that they can explain it to students in the future as well. It's just that type of crossover that we're having that's so exciting here at Henry Ford. It doesn't happen everywhere. I know because I just came back from a statewide meeting of other vice presidents and deans, and when they were asking us how we were able to do it, and I was telling them what we were doing, there was a lot of people taking notes. And I've had two vice presidents from other colleges call me this week and say, can we talk to you more about your SEM team? And they're also talking to us about our debt forgiveness program. So we're doing a lot of good things here at Henry Ford, and it's turning around. And I'm, I'm, it isn't me. It's definitely the staff who are doing it. I'm so proud of them. Questions? Oh. Okay, Trustee Barry first. Not a question, just a comment. Uh, with employment uh, at all time low, uh, and like you said, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to recruiting and mm -hmm. uh, uh, retention. So I, I'm sure we, the threat of recession has something to do with it, but I don't think it plays a big role. I truly believe when you say it's a cultural change, I truly believe that. Uh, once people feel respected, and welcomed, it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. We're not where we want to be, but we're definitely heading in the right direction. So thank you. Oh, thank and you. thank you to Dr. Nealon, to Holly Diamond and her team, you know, for everything you've done. I, 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 I'm I, sensing that there is a culture change here. And uh, thank you for our great leader, President Cavaluna, for pushing this issue. And I know you take it. I understand you're spending a lot of time at the Welcoming Center these days. So that's much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Vibes are there. Trust, we're just going to go down the line. Trustee McDonald. Mine is also uh, more of a comment. Um, when we met in January, I was intrigued by the idea of the SEM group. Now I'm just over the moon impressed. I really am at what you've been able to accomplish in such a short time. So I want to, again, give kudos to everyone involved. I think it's outstanding. Um, I also had heard something, and I had planned on saving this for commentary, uh, but I think this is an appropriate place to put it. Um, there was, I just read that um, House Bills 4546 and 4547 uh, that just, that would expand dual enrollment possibilities have just been passed through uh, both the House Ways and Means and the Educational Committee, and that would allow dual enrollment students to attend summer classes which I thought was very intriguing. So now it's going for the full house and not that I have a whole lot of faith in the legislator at this time, but that might be something that would uh, we can expect in the future and it would uh, also help and we can serve more students. The strong dual enrollment program we have here is amazing. When I yeah, came in, absolutely. I was amazed on all, all the stuff that we'd been able to do. I thought we had a good one when I the school I left, but it doesn't touch what, what we were able to do here. Absolutely, and I think we've scratched the surface. I think we can do so much better. Sailing so. the Blue Waters. There's a book called the Management Book about sailing to blue waters to find open markets, and that's one of the books that Jennifer, uh, Dr. Ernst, had given me. And so that's another book that we're passing around to try to understand what are where our markets are, where we can expand our markets, and definitely mm -hmm. dual enrollment is one of them. Good. Well, kudos again to everyone that's been involved. Dr. Mead, did you have your hand? You know, one of the one of the topics that uh, <coughs> I think have helped to support the enrollment increase is the orientation program. Yes. And help me to understand, I, it's my understanding that every student has to take the orientation, whether online or in person. 
Is that true? Miss Diamond, would you explain exactly? Because it's, 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 it's every student, but it's not, I mean, it's, please. Come on up, come on up. Come on up, Polly. Okay. <laughs> when I get questions like this, Polly's on speed. Well, I understand, it's part of the team. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Good evening. Orientation at Henry Ford College is mandatory. And we took that position a couple of years ago, recognizing student success was something that was, we needed to really focus on. There are a couple of um, exemptions. So if you're a transfer student maybe, who already has a bachelor's degree, coming back from additional schooling, you don't have to do orientation. Okay, and good. dual enrollment is not required, but we do have a special, um, this is new, a brand new online dual enrollment <coughs> excuse me, orientation session. And that is something that the high schools have wanted. We used to go to the high schools for dual enrollment orientation. But now they come here or they do the online. Good. Well, in, I helped uh, on the first couple of days when we started the semester. I was out in the middle of the campus helping people to find where they're going. And by and large, they knew where they were going. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that's a great start. They knew where the buildings were. They knew which ones they should be going to. Every once in a while, I get somebody ask a question, but mainly they're just moving along. And so I, I attribute that to the orientation so that they understand where the buildings are and where their classes are and that type of thing, and they know what the services are. So that makes them feel that uh, they're more, this is a more comfortable place for them to be because they know all those services are there for them. So I just, I think that's just such a good idea to keep emphasizing the orientation. Okay, and the second thing is, uh, we, a long time ago, uh, students could transfer back six credits from the university to finish their associate degree. Mm -hmm. Is that still a policy? Mm -hmm. All right, is there any discussion about maybe uh, having that be larger so that we can get more students to come back and finish their associate degrees? Well, I'm excited to tell you that it is larger. <laughs> okay. This, this is a change, you know, progressively over the years since I've been here, we've had to take a hard look at some of our policies and procedures. They weren't maybe necessarily student friendly okay. or um, advantageous to the institution. And so we have a, a very robust trans reverse transfer program. And our largest reverse transfer might surprise you. It's not our friends next door. It's Wayne State University. Ah. We do a lot of reverse transfers. Would you think EMU would be open to that? Um, they Actually, they signed an agreement with us. We just don't have as many because we have that really good 3 plus 1 program with them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I understand. 80 credits or something? Yeah, they, they, they take, they're very generous with our students. Okay. Hmm. Well, those were my uh, two comments that Thanks. I had. I appreciate it very much. I, I do have one caution. We're, we're, demographics are not necessarily in our favor. And uh, we're celebrating now. What are we going to do if it's down next time? I don't think that way, actually. I know you don't. You're very positive, but I don't want you to get all these kudos and then find out that the demographics shot you down. We're still changing a lot of our processes and policy. We're okay. still trying to figure out where the blue water is, where we can find students who we can, we can help recruit and bring here, give them a great education and get them